Support. All right. A move by myself, supported by Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, same sign. Okay, the ayes have it. I will turn the meeting over to you. Clerk Sechrist. Um, I uh, asked uh, for a roll call. I move that the board go into close session for the purposes of discussing pending litigation in the instance of uh, Charter Township of Canton v. 650 Incorporated. Port. All right. Roll. Please call roll. Minsky. Aye. Snydeman. Aye. Slavens. Aye. Segrist. Aye. Uh, Ganguly. Aye. 534, we are going into closed session. <laughs> Fourteen, and we. I would like a motion uh, to return from closed session. So moved. Support. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, if we could stand for the pledge of allegiance. Flag of the United States of America, and to. Public for which it stands. Uh, indivisible. indivisible. Okay, thank you. And I have a motion. Madam Chair, I move that uh, to approve the attorney's recommendation in the case of Charter Township of Canton v. 44650 Incorporated and authorize the township supervisor to sign all the necessary documents to effectuate the recommendation. Support. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Now we are going to go into the study. Start with a discussion on fire station number four. Hello. Um, I was wondering if maybe we could go into a um, break. Um, I got a nice surprise for you guys outside. I uh, wanted to show you the fire new truck. fire truck that Yay. was delivered. So maybe okay. we could take a, take a little recess for five minutes. Absolutely. You have the prerogative right. of chair. We will have five minutes of recess, maybe ten. <laughs> Well, we are back, and thank you so much. What a beautiful truck. Now we get to talk some exciting stuff. And last time we were in for a session on the uh, fire department, we were kind of begging for you guys to uh, find us money, and you did that. So <laughs> get to work. That's right. That's right. So now we now we got a good problem, right? And that's. Uh, we didn't tackle for those of you that haven't. She's our. Barb 2.0, so Barb Crusoe's there, so. <laughs> um, and, and she's gonna be instrumental in moving forward with the process. Very helpful, and she did everything on the first station for us. Going to be uh, those footsteps there, so um, she's gonna be instrumental. Everything that the architect sends over. So, but real quick, I'm going to turn it over to you know Jamie Strasner and uh, Michael Malone, Bill Hayes, and we'll be talking a little bit as well. But uh, turn it over to Jamie just to kind of talk about 
on that. All right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I know we've shown this slide probably lots of times, uh, but the first slide on the left there is basically showing our current deployment. And uh, it's highlighted with those, obviously, those red areas that show 10 minute uh, response time for station one. And uh, the, the response area map uh, to the right kind of paints a much better picture of the station four located down on Michigan Avenue. And you can see, number one, obviously, the, the most important thing is that we shouldn't really have any more 10 minute responses to the southeast corner of the township. Uh, but we also have that dark line that we've kind of just superimposed on that map to kind of show you kind of like where Station Forge response area will be. And primarily that, that east part where it'll obviously take the expressway 275, but right up at Cherry Hill, which is where that box is as it kind of goes to the farthest east part of the township there, that section, that is our most highly populated section in the township based on recent, the most recent uh, census information. And uh, that was also one of our longest response areas as well. So this obviously, like you guys know, we've said it, we said it, this is really gonna satisfy this need to uh, service anyone that needs fire department services in those areas. So very excited. So that's really all we're gonna talk about for the need, because we all past that point. Um, kind of decided that moving forward and then what we wanted to bring to you tonight is, is we're kicking around the idea of building the same fire station. Quite a few reasons for that. And the first reason is, is that um, we already have those. That's going to be the biggest thing of building the same. Obviously, we're going to do some changes to the station. Um, but the biggest thing is going to be the time frame. Go back out and um, that's really why we wanted to talk to you more. Know we have the property there. We know what we want to build. Right, and it's going to continue to grow. So this is kind of the uh, idea that we brought to you in the last. Um, Quick snapshot. This is the corner of Lily and Michigan Avenue. Exit out on And so, with the future considerations, um, I was actually just talking to Michael before you guys were in the back there. Um, we know that we've got some future needs coming, probably um, down the road a little ways, but um, we own all that property there. We want to make sure that when we buy that property out, that we leave enough um, you know, room and enough space to continue to grow. Uh, we know that. A burn building that's going to be on the architect to make sure that when we're going to as um, <coughs> you may have heard me talk in the past, um, I know I've talked.
So with that being said, um, we don't want to build that, that facility right now. Um, obviously, we have the money for it. Make sure that we keep all these things in mind as we move forward. Um, Open Door Ministries called the supervisor the second they heard that we got concerned about the parking down there. Um, we want to make sure. All that in mind as we develop the site. With that being said, um, I'm going to turn it over to Michael just to kind of talk about the engineering services um, we're going to do. Um, so what you have before you is, is kind of a summary of our proposal for continuing our services. Um, we're assuming this project is you know, based on discussions with Chris, is going to be very similar to the station we've already built. We know there's going to be some some tweaks to the plan. Some things aren't exactly the way they want them, I guess, after living there for a while, um, which that's fine. Um, and then we understand the township may want to consider um, geothermal or some other sustainable features to be incorporated. Uh, so we've accounted for that as well. Um, and schedule up here, but um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just zip through these really quick. So, so there's there's four phases: uh, schematic, design, and design development is really just a a very quick and easy phase that we're going to confirm the plan we have. We're going to meet with Chris and his team to determine anything that needs to be changed. The heavy focus of that. Really, first task is the site development and the future developments that you may consider. So there's going to be a lot of site planning involved there. Um, and then we will get right into uh, the development or the construction drawings uh, documents. Uh, part of that is site plan approval. So there's, you know, we're anticipating a streamlined, streamlined, but a simple site plan approval process in our timeline. Um, we, we're not anticipating the challenges we've had with the, the site with the site over at Station 2 with the wetlands and all that. We may have other challenges that we're unaware of, but uh, we're not, I don't know, the challenge yet. Uh, so we're hoping we can get in, you know, get to a site plan quickly, get it approved, and. and Bidding and construction administration is really uh, the same way we've done it in the previous station, um, assisting the township with soliciting bids, reviewing those bids, helping you select the, the most responsible bidder, and then you know, administering the contract. Uh, this uh, total cost summary here, so our, our proposed fee is a fixed number. It's not going to vary based on the, the bids or anything. That, that's what we're proposing, 474.4. Um, we have a budget for reimbursables, which is really just some printing and mileage. Uh, there wasn't any plan review fees, I don't believe, this time around, so the township will waive those. Um, we're building in a contingency or asking to be built in a design contingency if there is some top sustainable things we need to explore with our engineers, we would maybe pull from that uh, contingency budget. Um, if it's not used, it's not used. It won't be charged. Um, anticipating a potential exploration for geothermal, typically we need to do a test well. So we need to really solicit a quotation to do that from a well driller. Uh, they'll test the conductivity of the, of the earth and determine what's in the soil. and. Um, you know, it shouldn't be 25,000, it should be less than that, but it's a placeholder. Um, and then, of course, we're going to need a site survey, which, which documents the property lines. Uh, the township requires a tree survey as well. So uh, we're anticipating about surveying about eight to nine acres of that property. Um, 
we're only going to use maybe two to three acres for the fire station, but to plan the, the other future training tower or other parking uh, and, and to understand the drainage patterns that are on the site. Uh, we think um, that's a not to exceed number uh, 17.5, might be a little bit lost. But. So just a, a couple of things on the um, fixed fee for the A&E. Um, I had a lot of discussion with Director Trumbull on that. Obviously, the uh, the sites are going to be the first one that we have to do. It's really added the cost. Um, we we understand that there's going to be a lot of operating costs that are going to be added to this site. It's not going to save us a ton of money, right? I mean, we're going to get back about a half a million dollars a year out of this site. So we're going to have to do this and then we're going to have to do the other one. Kind of the tasks and what we're projecting on the timeline. Um, you know, obviously, this is going to be a lot of work. <laughs> but um, at any rate, um, the tasks that, that uh, Michael had talked about uh, moving through them pretty fast and possibly even breaking ground. I would say, sorry to interrupt you there. Um, we allocate about 22 weeks from when you say go till us uh, being able to get in there. We have a couple holidays in there, but uh, it's pretty aggressive. But we kind of know what we're going to do. It's going to work. A lot of this stuff relatively quickly. Again, assuming we can get a quick uh, site plan approval township with any. it in June and then hopefully start it so <clears throat> that's really what we want to present tonight um, you know we're looking to bring an RBA forward to the board to waive the bidding process and we'd like to have some um, comments and discussions <clears throat> like I said in the past we've had a good relationship going out the bid But the one thing that I can say about the partners in our That being said, I'm happy to take any questions. Or Anybody have any questions or comments? Well, I'll just say I was really happy with our vision two. So. Timelines. I like the idea of breaking ground a little bit longer. I know Gary is overseeing the work in some of the work in Cherry Hill Village as well during that time period. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> even dream to ask that. I would expect nothing less. Yeah. 
Cherry Hill Village project. Um, I think we're issuing that to bid in, in January. So that'll be ahead of this one, you know. The documents are kind of in development right now. Questions or comments? Tanya? Yeah, so uh, usually how long does it take? We would we would guesstimate about twelve months. Twelve months. Yeah. Depending on the winter, you know, is it gonna be a rough winter or a light winter? Don't really know. But I think twelve months for sure we should be able to do that. Obviously we're giving you a, a you know I'm assuming that there's not going to be, um, but you know, we never know. Any other? Kate? Yeah, thank you. Um, I find this very exciting, and um, yeah, I I absolutely love Fire Station too. It's beautiful. So I. Uh, those plans because I think it turned out great. Um, I am a little curious about um, what you were saying about the parking lot and open door ministry. Um, just wondering, are, are they having issues with parking? Um, or are they concerned that, you know, that we will be taking parking away from them? Or, or just yeah, so curious. currently they park on Lily Road there, um, and they were concerned that we were going to be exiting out to Lily Road. So we're looking at that as a corridor. And then they are using the open door ministry and the parking that is right in front of them. Um, I know if you ever go down there on the weekend, it's fantastic down there. They have great service and everything. So I think that they are a little bit concerned about that. Okay, so we they would be utilizing parking that we were building for the fire station. For the fire station. Yep. Okay. Again, I think that that would be a space that would be a massive parking lot for them. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think it's fully appropriate what you're proposing, especially with us being able to save money by copying sort of the station too. So I have no problem with that. Uh, I think that's the right way to go. Um, my only question was on the alternative energies. Um, you mentioned geothermal, which is great, exciting to look at. Are there other alternative energies that we can look at? Why, why limit it to just that? Well, we, we wouldn't limit it to that. I mean, we okay. would, we're open to exploring um, various aspects or however the township would like us to explore. Um, I mean, we did have, see that we, we bid out like some solar panels, I think, on the first station as an alternate, and, and it, the cost was prohibitive at that time. Okay. Um, but that could be studied as, as well. Um, and depending on the, the results of the test well, that may deter you from doing geothermal, but there's other very highly efficient systems. You know, there's heat pump systems that you don't need ground source uh, to utilize. Um, our engineers are open to exploring that. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's really part of the the base fee, and then you know we have the contingency if there's something that's you know we really got to do a lot of extra stuff, but. Had a discussion, Michael and I, and then we've also I've also spoken with the supervisor about you using the uh, fire and water department. Yeah, well. right. So <laughs> uh, that's yeah. oh wow, yeah, that's pretty yeah. obvious. So yeah. that, that plan is right there. Um, <clears throat> you know, there, there's some some issues with methane. It's a dirty, beautiful area. So, right. Um, that's going to come with some maintenance costs and other other issues that we have to deal with. So I'm sure that that's going to be something that we're going to have to deal with. But those those are the core of what we're looking at. 
Thank you. Yeah, good point. Yeah, well, I agree too. I'm excited. Uh, uh, Fire Station Two is wonderful. Oh, we all agree on that, and we do know that we need this. Definitely a needed fire station, so I'm excited as well. And the geothermal, we have a little cottage up north and we have geothermal, and it heats and cools just fine, so it's great. Nice. It's a good way to um, stay warm. Well, thank you very much. Any other questions? I know that we're, um, I was speaking with Director Trumbull, so I'll bring an RBA forward. Um, we're just making sure that the date right I believe October 1st right talk about the tornado recovery update Good evening. Uh, I was asked by uh, Supervisor Graham Hudek to uh, bring the board up to date on what our response and recovery efforts have been uh, with regard to the flooding and tornado from August the 24th. So we'll start with August 24th. During, during the early morning hours of August 24th, Canton was hit by an unprecedented rainfall of more than six inches of rain uh, across the township. I know this is hard to read, but in the northern areas, uh, like along the Plymouth Township, uh, there was 3.89, I think it is, inches of rain, and to the south uh, in Romulus was 7.36. Uh, DPW estimated that we received more than six and a half inches of rain that day in a very condensed uh, period of time. The result of this was major street flooding, causing extensive traffic backups and stranding numerous motorists who attempted to tra traverse the floodwaters. First responders took hundreds of calls throughout the evening, uh, early morning hours. Uh, from those requiring rescue and those reporting flooding and or flooded roadways. In a 24-hour period, our dispatch took more than 1,200 phone calls from residents, which is a very unprecedented number. Uh, they were reporting various things from water damage, power outages, stranded motorists, uh, downed trees, and power lines. And throughout the township, DTE recorded uh, numerous po power outages. By 5 p.m. that day, the State Emergency Operations Center was activated in response to these storms, which swept across the Lower Peninsula into Southeast Michigan. Uh, at approximately 5.30, I was able to facilitate um, an aviation asset from the Michigan State Police to allow Supervisor Graham Hudak to uh, get a visual assessment from the air to areas that were damaged here in Canton that were largely inaccessible by vehicle. Uh, after uh, observing the extent of the flood damage firsthand at approximately <coughs> 8 p.m., Supervisor Graham Hudak, in consultation with emergency management and the Michigan State Police Emergency Management and Homeland Security Division, declared a local state of emergency. The local state of emergency was declared indicating that our local resources had been exhausted. This allows us to receive assistance from Wayne County and the Michigan State Police. Similarly, Wayne County also declared a state of emergency for the county. As this board may be aware, uh, Canton Emergency Management is one of seven uh, Public Act 390 uh, programs within Wayne County, meaning we have the ability to act on emergency management uh, functions independent of the county. As a result of the excessive rainfall that uh, fell that uh, early morning hours, it became necessary for the Western Township Utility Authority, sorry, 
became necessary for the Western Township Utility Authority to release partially treated effluent into the Lower River Rouge uh, early in the evening. The Wayne County Health Department was requested to issue a public health notice to encourage individuals to avoid coming in contact with the water in the Lower River Rouge Basin. During our aviation uh, viewing, we saw numerous people swimming, wading, riding bikes, et cetera, in the floodwaters. And we determined that that was probably not the best thing for public health. Of course, later that evening, we received the second uh, punch. Uh, I notified uh, leadership of a potential for yet another severe weather event. According to the National Weather Service, this event was not going to have the significant rainfall that it was first predicted to have. However, they were forecasting winds between 70 and 80 miles an hour, which are pretty catastrophic. At approximately 10 p.m., uh, I was made aware of a tornado warning through the National Weather Service impacting parts of Wayne County, particularly Canton. Canton dispatch was notified and sounded the outdoor warning sirens. As you're aware now, we was determined that we did uh, have a confirmed EF0 tornado, which means maximum sustained winds of 80 miles per hour. As you can see from the map, the tornado touched down in the area of Pheasant Run Golf Course and was on the ground in a southeasterly direction for approximately 1.7 miles until it dissipated over the Lower River Rouge. In addition to the tornado, Many areas in Canton experience simultaneous winds, straight line winds, reaching 90 miles an hour, causing extensive damage across the township. Widespread uh, winds can often be uh, characterized. People, uh, when we were out and about in the community, thinking that, saying that they had a tornado up on Warren Road as well. The National Weather Service comes out and they assess based on the rotation of the trees and the of damage, what, whether it was a tornado or not, and they determined that those were in fact straight line winds. On August 25th, the state of Michigan <coughs> issued a declaration of state of emergency for Wayne and Monroe counties. This declaration was later amended to include Ingham, Ionia, Kent, Livingston, Macomb and Oakland counties. As it turned out, we sustained a tornado outburst with seven tornadoes touching down in Michigan. The declaration expired on September 22nd, 2023. We coordinated maximum state effort and called upon all state departments to utilize available resources to assist in the designated areas according to the Michigan Emergency Management Plan. This allowed us to ask access the Michigan State Police Aviation Unit not once, but twice. First, to assess the flood damage, and second, later within the 24-hour period, to assess the tornado damages in Pheasant, uh, in the park, uh, Heritage Park. It also gave us access to state GIS resources <laughs> to conduct the damage assessment utilizing state provided tablets rather than utilizing pen and paper reports, which would then require manual input into the Michigan Critical Incident Management System program. This also made DPW assets from Wayne County Emergency Management to provide additional road close signs as the township had exhausted our own resources. We additionally received more than 150 muck-out kits from the Wayne County Homeland Security and Emergency Management Division for distribution to our residents who needed them. On August 25th, I began soliciting assistance for our residents through Michigan 211, which is a United Way program. Such help would, bring, would come from organizations such as Team Rubicon, Samaritan's Purse, Southern Baptist, and or crisis cleanup. It would come in the form of limited financial assistance, muck out kits and debris removal, as well as chainsaw teams to help our residents remove downed trees and limbs. 
This request was approved by the State Emergency Operations Center on Sunday, August 27th. Immediately following the storms, we created a QR code to share on social media and on our township website, allowing residents to self-report damage. With the self-reporting, we were able to capture more than 150 unique addresses of individuals who reported damage from either the flooding or the high winds and tornado. These addresses were combined with the list that DPW had collected and compiled to create a list of those homes that required an in-person visit. From August 26 through September 1st, local damage assessment teams made up of township personnel and community emergency response team personnel received just-in-time training on how to conduct damage assessments. The teams then canvassed the township, assessing and recording the damage. The findings were then reported to the Michigan State Police Emergency Management and Homeland Security Division. More than 491 unique addresses were visited in the days following the storm to assess this damage. Many of these came from the self-assessment tool or the DPW list, or the aerial surveillance conducted on the 20th. When the assessors, assessors were out and found a location where several homes were impacted, they knocked on the door of adjacent homes to locate additional homes that might have been impacted. They would continue tracking homes until they determined that homes were no longer impacted. In total, we determined more than 150 homes were affected, 56 had minor damage, and 13 had major damage. This damage is defined by FEMA and is very specific to flood and or tornado damage. You could have a home that had eight feet of water in the ba basement, their mechanicals were wiped out, that being heating, cooling, uh, water heater, electrical, and that would only be minor damage according to FEMA, unless they lived in that basement and had no other place in the house where they could have uh, been living. So if your kid lives down in the basement, but they're off to college, they would not consider that they're very specific about their damage. So once we had this information, we had to capture an estimated dollar amount for the damage to the private property. In conjunction with Joe Urbanic, building official, we came up with the following estimates, which were uh, validated by Tim Convertis from the Michigan State Police Emergency Management and Homeland Security Di Division. Indica uh, assessed a major damage to be an estimated $70,000 per, per damage, minor impact at $20,000 per home, and affected at $1,000. This made, meant that we had uh, in excess of $2 million of individual damages within the township. This information was input into MySIMS, Michigan Critical Incident Management System, as required by close of business on Wednesday, September 6th. The specific dollar amount for business losses was not required. Rather, this information was to be co collected in the public impact statement in MySIMS. So then we looked at public assistance assessments. Zach Michelle and his team from planning assessed photographed and mapped a total of 194 trees that the township is responsible for, which, re which required removal after falling in the storm or extensive tree limb removal and cleanup. Cleanup costs included stump grinding and hollowway, as well as replacement. The tree damage total came to $133,092. And this is based on a, a particular contract the township has uh, with uh, our landscaping company, Crimboli, I believe it is. And so the state kept saying, well, you can't replace a tree for $200. Well, because we have a contract, we can and we will replace those trees. That was a, a fairly accurate number that we assessed. 
Um, so we had extensive damage. Uh, of course, this is just one particular picture in front of the summit. Many of the trees in the summit parking lot were decimated all up and down uh, uh, the parkway there. Uh, trees were damaged. On this map uh, to the left, uh, each one of our street trees in the township that we are responsible for is indicated by one of these yellow, I'm sorry, green dots on the map. And it has basically an identifying number. So that's how we were able to track it. And that's what was required by FEMA in order to track that. Additionally, the township incurred nearly $17,000 in added costs for debris removal and extra uh, collection. We had a police vehicle that was damaged in the flood responding to an emergency. Additionally, overtime costs of approximately $44,000 were incurred during the emergency response period to this incident. This includes fringe benefits. But keep in mind, this does not account for personnel that were already working and on shift during the incident and or during the immediate cleanup. This is only overtime hours. As you're also probably aware, we sustain uh, additional damage to the splash pad, heritage park pavilions, the summit roof sustained damage, as well as other park buildings, goalposts and fences throughout a number of parks in the township. These damages, however, will be covered under the township insurance after payment of a $1,000 deductible. The uninsured damage to township-owned facilities and properties totaled $203,559. Our public assistance doesn't stop there. It also covers the Plymouth Canton Community Schools, which sustained significant damage. The district sustained uninsured losses for environmental testing, roof drain divergency testing, and replacement of the AstroTurf at Canton High, that Canton High School athletic field, which was destroyed when it was lifted by floodwaters and the underlayment shifted. Replacement costs for the field are estimated at nearly $575,000. The Plymouth Canton Community Schools incurred uninsured expenses for the use of alternative athletic fields and will continue to do so until a replacement can be completed. <coughs> Excuse me. The damage to Plymouth Canton Community School property totaled $614,816. The storm also wreaked havoc on many Canton businesses that experienced flooding power outage and or wind damages. This includes Kohl's, which is shown here, and First Watch, which were closed for 34 days while they uh, were repaired, while repairs could be completed. <coughs> Community impact is also factored in to the FEMA assessment when they uh, evaluate damage to the township. But what does this look like? The initial damage assessments reported to the Michigan State Police Emergency Management Division were reviewed and analyzed by the MSP Recovery Unit. On September 8th, <coughs> excuse me, 2023, the Recovery Unit submitted an individual assistance and public assistance data to FEMA for a joint PDA public uh, damage assessment, <coughs> excuse me one moment, no. <coughs> yeah, you might need it. Um, so a request was uh, subsequently uh, for public, I'm sorry, I lost the line here. Shortly thereafter, the recovery unit collected additional public assistance data on eligible costs and potential insurance coverage before submitting a public assistance request. A request for public assistance was subsequently submitted to FEMA. From September 18th to September 22nd, a joint preliminary damage assessment team made up of FEMA, Small Business Administration, and Michigan State Emergency Management personnel came to Canton to validate the information that our volunteer damage assessment team provided and 
complete cost estimates. Based on FEMA criteria, some of our assessments were modified, either up or down. Uh, in some instances, they determined that it was sewage water that, that backed up into a home and that bumped it up into a different category, or they determined that the damage was not as extensive as, as we initially determined it to be. Additionally, the following week, a similar joint preliminary damage assessment team conducted a virtual validation of public damage deducting those costs that are those losses that were covered by insurance. Ultimately, Canton Township is seeking monetary recovery for public tree damage and removal of debris, emergency response overtime for employees and the police cruiser damaged by flood water, as well as our insurance deductible totaling the $203,000. The Plymouth Canton School District is seeking the $614,000 for the items I previously described. The Joint preliminary damage assessment team will then assess the information to determine if a presidential disaster declaration is appropriate. If so, it will move to the governor's office to determine if they wish to push the request forward or not. FEMA Region 5 will then review the request for legal sufficiency and make a recommendation to the FEMA regional administrator. If the regional administrator, once they validate the request, they will make a recommendation to FEMA headquarters. FEMA headquarters also conducts a legal sufficiency review and will make a recommendation to the FEMA administrator. If the FEMA administrator concurs, then they will make a recommendation on the presidential declaration. Ultimately, the president will decide whether or not a disaster declaration will be issued, potentially authorizing federal disaster assistance. So this is this loop that we, we have here. I think I have a pointer. There we go. So we did the local assessments. FEMA came out and did their joint preliminary assessments. We're at this stage now. FEMA is assessing that information to determine whether or not it warrants moving on to a presidential. Sometimes, and now we're almost two months out from that initial, the initial storm, sometimes when the da damage isn't as obvious as, say, a Katrina or a Superstorm Sandy, which takes this expedited route, it's clear that, let's say, all of Mobile, Alabama is underwater, and it's very easy to say they need presidential help, and the, you, you take out all that preliminary damage assessment. Unfortunately, our damage was spread across the state and, and it wasn't every single home. It was certain homes that were impacted, some more than others. So we have to take this other route and we're awaiting these decisions by FEMA. So those decisions are out of our hands at this time. We're just awaiting those responses. In the event that we don't receive a presidential de declaration, the municipality can apply to the state of Michigan under this contingency fund. And based on the size of Canton, we would be eligible for uh, up to $1 million in public assistance, which would cover those costs that we incurred during the as well as those costs incurred by the school. So just a few. Public assistance is for public facilities that that would include the schools, if we had any hospitals uh, that received damage, if we had any roadways that were washed out or bridges that were washed out, it'd cover those type of things, not individual uh, folks in their homes and the belongings and things that would be in their homes. With that, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to. Are any questions or comments? Thanks, Will, for the uh, update on what went on. It's still hard to believe <laughs> all that happened here. Um, our, um, I'll take my second question first. The, what you just said about individual assistance uh, from FEMA or from the state, is that something we help residents to apply for or apply for on their behalf? If, if we do, in fact, receive that declaration, FEMA would send a team out here 
we would publicize that. They would have a, a designated location set up where the public could come. It might be in the building here where they could come and learn about loans or grants or any other kind of programs that the, the government may open up. So there, there's a multitude of, of options the federal government has when doing this. They can do grants, they can do small loans, personal loans, they can do individual loans, things like that, to help the residents uh, recover. So they set up these disaster teams and they bring them out in in, in our case, since it's spread across the state, there would be multiple of these facilities uh, that folks could come to. We'd have to publish that and ensure that our residents are made aware of that. Just because we didn't visit their house doesn't mean they wouldn't be eligible, because there was plenty of folks that, you know, they had flood damage, maybe they went and stayed with a relative or a neighbor, and we didn't catch them at home. If, if this is approved, they would still have an opportunity to go that include businesses as well? So businesses would be co covered under Small Business Administration as well. So I, I mentioned that as part of the damage assessment team, small business went out and, and the gentleman from small business and I went to a number of businesses. We don't have to go to every single one. All they have to do is get a snapshot from the community and, and they could see they took our pictures preliminary damage assessments and we went and talked to several businesses and tried to determine what was lost and, and what would be covered or not. Same thing, they would be eligible to apply for these grants. Even after the fact? After the fact. So right. if they so they could, if they fixed it and put money out to do that's it? That's correct. Okay, they can. And that's what we tried to, to reassure and encourage our, our folks. And it's true with any type of insurance loss, whether it's a car accident or, or anything take photographs, get good statements, get good reports, because that's what FEMA will rely on. In one case, we had one home, I believe it was on Sheldon Road, where the branch went through the roof. The house was essentially repaired. It was covered with blue tarp and, and whatever. And FEMA goes, oh, we don't agree that this is you know, major damage because, the, look, it's almost already repaired. I said, well, yeah, because, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. So in, in any case, I mean, there are there are very stringent rules in that. So if those people had other uh, uh, receipts and could show damage, uh, what was damaged, they could go back still and, and apply. My last question. Um, does any of the process that you oversee include looking at, like, our drains in our community and whether there are improvements that could be made or changes that could be made that could help with future so events? So as the result of this process, no, that's not the same thing. That would be under hazard mitigation. State, county do a hazard mitigation plan. And we can include that in our hazard mitigation plan. I know there have been some ideas thrown around, for instance, Grandview Estates, um, some of the flooding that occurred there, and it's occurred on multiple occasions now. Perhaps looking at some, some options. That would be separate from this particular process. There is no uh, funding in this process for mitigation. So that would be well, is there any process to whether we need to do anything or not? Um, I'm assuming there is. And when you look at the intersection of Ford and Canton Center and what happened there and why it all happened the way it did, and you can adjust changes. Um, as part of this process, no, but again, as part of hazard mitigation, okay. yes. Um, there has been uh, speculation from folks that some of the road repairs might have uh, exacerbated the situation. Okay, thank I'm you. Not, I'm not an engineer. So. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Questions or comments? Uh, so um, <clears throat> you showed us where we were. Usually, how long does it usually take? What happens the declaration? You know, each uh, it's a great question. I wish I had a simple answer for you. Each disaster is unique, okay. and and the fact again, as I said, the, the folks, the team that I was out with, there was like seven or eight folks on this team. They said usually they can go like into a block and all you see is the, the peak of the house uh, up over the flood. That's the only thing that's showing. 
or a tornado comes through and a whole neighborhood is gone and, and there was 20 houses there before, it's very easy to assess that. It's very difficult to assess flood damages, again, because of, you know, if we can't find people at home, uh, they, they just put, you know, unable to contact. Um, so they have to have certain numbers that they reach. So it's much more difficult when you have to go through a number of different neighborhoods and assess this. Uh, we have done the process that we are required to do. It was done and submitted in a timely fashion. And, and the state, in fact, I was just at a, a meeting Eight last week, or yeah, last week, and asked about this, and they said it could be several more weeks before they. You, you see that very complicated, yeah. convoluted yeah. process um, that the federal government has to go through to get this through. So we're at the very beginning of that federal process now. Volunteers and everybody. Um, thank you, Will. That was um, just to, for one thing, to put some dollars on image. I never imagined that uh, we have such such a big um, As you know, um, Anne Marie and I both were helping with the damage assessment and. I went to several homes um, where the people were traumatized and they didn't necessarily have a lot of damage um, according to the FEMA rules or guidelines on that, um, but they were traumatized. And I'm wondering if there are thoughts or ways, um, thoughts of or ways that we can help the trauma of, of this. Um, you know, the, the stories I heard were very, very touching, <laughs> and I'm still going to remember the widow who, um, you know, is on a fixed income and makes money by selling things on Etsy, and her whole supply of items that she sells were just, they were destroyed because they were in her basement. And she didn't know what she was going to do. So, um, how can we help with the trauma of, of these events? Well, one, one of the services that is provided by United Way through the 211, they do offer some uh, services as well. So we can avail, and we did, we're telling our residents as soon as we knew that 211 was now available, we were telling our, our volunteers to let people know, call 211, try and get some help. I will caveat that with there are some limitations to 211. That is for services such as crisis cleanup, which is the actual mucking out and helping roll up the, the waterlogged carpeting or waterlogged furniture or mattresses, et cetera, or, or chopping up trees. Those are volunteer groups that do that, and they're limited by their volunteer capacity. Right. And we strung them out throughout the whole you know middle part of the state from Grand Rapids all the way across down to Monroe. And so they were strapped in on volunteers. Sometimes when it's a big major event like a tornado or a hurricane, you get volunteers that come in from all across the nation. We didn't have that because we didn't it wasn't that type of a storm for us, fortunately. Uh, but <coughs> crisis uh, counseling Available as part of that United Way services. Okay, so if someone um, wasn't aware of this yet, we should still tell them to call 211. We can still tell them to call 211. 211 is, is essentially but it just may not be operational for our storm. It might be get a worker out of Lansing or out of Galen or something like that, but it's just really not a big deal. It's not going to be a big deal. It just means that we can try to get people to come back and they can get help. It's a major event. It's not going to be a big deal. But it's 
Again, I mean, we can only control our own We had, uh, as you know, uh, 30 plus volunteers that have been working over the weekend and throughout that following week. It was very helpful to us uh, just to be able to do that. Wayne County hadn't been able to even start theirs until like Thursday of that following week. So we were ahead of the game. So. Yeah, and I, I wanted to, to give them a little plug, too, because um, the community emergency response team, um, they came out, and what a group of people. They are the nicest, most caring people, um, and I just was amazed by them. So I very much thank all of, all of the volunteers who came. Um, that you can sign up for community emergency response team. Um, I think there was a sign up I saw on um, our website, so I would just plug that too. So. I can't also say enough about our uh, CERT volunteers. I mean, as you know, they have stepped up time and time and time again, stepped up during COVID to give vaccinations, to give. COVID, uh, do COVID testing out in the park when it was 16 below zero. I had an 87 year old gentleman who was a volunteer who stood out there with me when it was 19 below zero, helping folks get their COVID testing. They've been available for water distribution when we had other uh, areas in the community, uh, not the community, but other areas in Rochester specifically that needed bottled water to fill up. And they took it out. Those people have stepped up. They've stepped up for Liberty Fest. They've stepped up for a number of different things. In fact, tomorrow they're doing another another COVID vaccination clinic through the Wayne County Mobile Health Unit. So they, time and time again, do step up. They're a very important asset for us. Thank you. I just wanted to answer Stephen. So our municipal services director is not here, but what happened um, for some of the construction sites that you talked about, so when they were doing construction on Ford Road, they put like a mesh underneath the drain to catch any leaves or anything during construction, and they were poking holes in them. So they were the DPW teams were out there poking holes and looking at the mesh, and the water was up to the top. Already. So that water could not get into the tributaries because they were overflowing. So that, you know, they, they were assuring that none of those meshes were stopping any of the water. We're also working with a consultant. Are those meshes still there? They're gone after construction. They're gone after construction. Yeah. They removed them. The, um, we're working with a consultant right now to determine the drain situation in Canton Township so we can make a recommendation to Wayne County about what has to be done. Um, our municipal services director, also Dave Norwood, is still going to homes to help assess. Yeah. Um, they're, they're calling him in. He was in one last Thursday. He's been, he went a couple days in a row to help a lady who was worried about, you know, some of the flooding around her house. So he's still doing those assessments and will work with, I think it's Wade Trim now, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. Wade Trim, bringing them in to help us go to the county and say, this is what needs to be done in Canton, and we need to look at a regional solution because we feed downstream and so on. That's happening right now. Okay. So I would also just like to add a comment on that as well. You know, uh, I don't think there's a storm drain system that I'm aware of in Southeast Michigan that's capable of handling seven inches of rain. You know, we frequently get those kind of rains in hurricane prone areas and whatever they, they can't handle that. Our systems are not designed for that capacity. So right. I had residents calling say, we need to pump this water. Okay, tell me exactly where I'm supposed to pump it to. Seven inches of rain fell across the entire township, and it's got to go somewhere, so it's going to find the lowest spot. Like you said on your CERT teams, we had a lot of people that wanted to volunteer. We had church groups come, they wanted to go to people, and it's important for the residents to certify themselves with the CERT team because we can't have people who have not been background checked. So CERT, someone, if you want to volunteer, you're background checked before you become part of the team so that we make sure you're safe to go to people's houses. So please, you know, how many did you get a lot of volunteers after the focus went uh, out? Two. 
I appreciate you saying that about the amount of rain because people yeah. don't think about yeah. that, but that was a lot of rain, yeah. and that's probably something that's not going to happen. Michael. Yeah, I listened to um, the DNR podcast because I'm a weirdo. Um, but one of the cool things is um, when you talk to anybody who does wildlife and land management, any farmer, they'll tell you climate is changing. Uh, we're seeing that. We are seeing substantially less snowfall. We are seeing increased rain. We are seeing substantially, substantially more aggressive rainstorms, 44%. More rain comes down in torrential than, than, we've, than we've experienced in the past. Um, my fear is that um, this will not be the only large rain we will experience in the, in the near or recent future in Canton Township. And I'm super grateful uh, to CERT to the emergency management team, to everybody in the township who, who kind of rolled up their sleeves and handled the emergency. Um, and I'm glad that we're proactively looking. We're engaging Wade Trim and we're proactively looking at um, how we could take um, potential stormwater and, and, and move it from the emergency response column and put it into the management or administration column to proactively handle it. And I think. It is wise to point out that no system, there's no system built by man yet that could handle that much rain. Hard is, whenever there's a perceived failure, everybody was looking for someone to blame. Something to blame, you know, you heard it on, I heard, you know, the first thing I heard on Ford Road was, oh, it's the construction, the, the mesh. Um, and then you find out, once we poked holes through the mesh, we, th th those, those drains were already full with water, so water was already getting through. But people wanted to believe that it was caused by the construction. People want to believe um, it's, a def it's a defective uh, subdivision drain. It's, it's, it's a defective whatever. But the, the moral of the story is I think we just don't, we don't, no system can handle that. But also, we haven't designed a system that can handle this much rain. Our entire stormwater system was built on different models with different levels of water. And 70% of the Canton development was developed to push water directly into the drain system. There's no detention or retention on any house built before 1990. Goal in my, my house, which was built in 79, was to get water to the property lines and then immediately to the street as fast as possible. That's a horrible way to build 20,000 units in a community. Worst is that all that water goes west or goes east to another community. Handle stormwater when it comes. Thank God we passed the uh, Clean Water Act, which forced us to start holding water on property and detaining it. But yeah, we got to do something on this. I really do. You know, one of the hardest parts for me, I think, um, in government is is we we have really really big problems that we sometimes don't necessarily know how to handle, um, or we say we can't handle them. Right? Um, we got a defective law around how to build drains, how to manage drains, how to fund stormwater management systems. It doesn't work. Um, and we've got to do something about that. Or something worse, or um, it's happened routinely over and over again. You know, we collectively did that around, around roads. And um, for SEMCOG meeting I ever went to, they threw up two fun graphs. One was, what are the concerns of residents in Southeast Michigan from an infrastructure perspective? And what would you think the number one concern was? Roads. Roads. Then they polled every single public works director in SEMCOG, all 150 or whatever of them, and said, what's your number one concern? And it was water. Everyone says roads because we drive on roads. People who handle all of that, their concern is water. And that's what's hard is, you know, we address roads because the public wants to address roads. And we successfully moved the needle in a large way on roads. Um, my concern is that uh, public works directors don't tend to drive public opinion or public policy to the extent. So. My hope is that we can find a way, maybe it's Wade Trim, who knows what it is, to address that, 
to tackle that and to create a system where while you can't handle 100% of the water 100% of the time, you can mitigate massive overflow and massive damage. Um, free. Thank you. Um, glad we are working on uh, I also want to thank you, Will, because um, I know not, you know, you've been helpful not just with, uh, you know, with this recent um, storm, COVID, you've always been there. So we really appreciate you um, for all that you, you know, do for all of us. Um, now, public comment. Uh, do we have any public comments? Yeah. Okay. Step up to the I'll podium, please. I might just comment. I, I just want to make sure the the what was released was not raw sewage. It was partially treated, so it took the solids and much of the waste out of it. It just wasn't in the final stage of treatment. Other public comments? Any other? Yes, please. If you want to stand at the podium, please. Thank you. Tell us your name, please. Had not yet read the standard, I'll be honest.
how do you make the time to come in and ask the question they would like to be asked? Wow, they're all in violation. all of them and mark them down. So you had a gentleman who came in and said, I want to make sure that I have my Hired because I now recommend that he be Ad, or her address, that would be wonderful. I okay. got it wrong twice already, and but I think it's two. Okay. Without fear. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other public comments? Any other public comments? No. Nope. Any board comments? 
I have a motion. <laughs> Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Support. Support. Okay, all in favor. Aye. Aye.